Uh, I'm George. Uh, welcome to Netflix. So uh, I'm also uh, working in the media cloud engineering team, uh, more specifically uh, from the media playback team. So media cloud engineering team, we uh, support a platform that uh, enables us to do media and uh, media transformation and uh, media innovation at scale for Netflix. Uh, more specifically, we focus on following areas such as uh, efficient cloud computing, uh, content agility, production agility, then secure storage, uh, certainly on the media processing workflows. So today, uh, I will focus more on the media processing workflow side. So I'll start with an overview of a workflow, how it looks like. Then we will talk some of the challenges that we are facing when we build such a system. Then we'll dive in deep into the Lua engine, which we use to orchestrate all the workflow execution. Then we'll conclude the talk with a summary. The media processing workflow, uh, from high level point of view, you can consider a workflow start with getting a raw media file. Then you do some processing. For example, uh, first you start with inspection likely. You will try to figure out what is the container format of the video source and how many number of channels or audio channels I got, right? Then you, based on this information, then it goes through a series of steps or transformation that needed to generate the final playable media that your end user consume. Uh, more specifically, this is the slides that Xiaomi had shown already. Right here, I'm going to emphasize a couple of the areas. So first, we got a video source uh, from content side, right? That is delivered in IM format in this case. So to speed things up, we do chunkings. We break the video into many, many small chunks. So in this case, we use 30 second unit length. length. Right, so essentially the video break, we break into 200 parts of this video. This means we run 200, about 200 faster if you do a series at one chunk. So speed wise, it's much faster doing this chunk the way. Then when all these chunks are done with encoding, we go through assembly process to put them together again as encoded video. Then this encoded video goes through a packaging process where it generates a format that your end devices can consume. So in this case, a generator format called MPEG dash format, so your end device can consume. So from this diagram, we talk more through the functional point of view, right? What should be done at certain stage of your workflow. So next, I'm going to go through from service architecture point of view, how we build a service to support such kind of workflows. So from service point of view, a workflow consists of three components. One is the API, so where the user can submit the request. They can query what is the status of my request to find out the progress. So at the center side is a Lua engine. We will dive more deep into it. So Lua engine essentially decides what should be done at certain conditions. So the right hand side, you see many dots. That is the computation unit Naveen had talked about in the previous session. These are, we call it service functions. So they do heavy media related computing like uh, encoding, right? uh, packaging, assembly. Right? They do this very media heavy computations and that is, we call them functions. Then we have a database that stores the workflow related information uh, such as your project data, status of each project. So before we dive deep into the Lua engine, I want to talk a couple of the challenges that we are facing when we design the system, like areas of scalability, operation side, then developer productivity side. From scalability point of view, we need to support hundreds of workflows. And at peak time, there's hundreds of thousands of CPU we need to run. <coughs> so to 
scale up or scale down automatically of so many instances, it's really a daunting task. From operation side, we need to support continuous integration and continuous deployment of so many workflows. That means that the many, many build jobs we need to maintain and many release pipelines you need to handle, right? And to monitor and get alerts ready for so, such a big system is not easy. When a request goes through a system that has many components or many layers of components, it will be extremely helpful if you can visualize what happened to my request, how many components it goes through, and what happens at each component. Right? You want to figure out how much time you spend at one component, probably that might be your bottleneck. Especially when the error happens in your system, you want to easily to find out at which component <coughs> and why. Right? So these are all the challenges we are facing from operation side. From developer productivity point of view, we really want to make things easy. Right? You shouldn't be that hard to get your job done. So we introduced some of uh, Blue DSL that helps us to uh, figure out errors really early during compile time instead of runtime you have to debug around. And we want to automate the data persistence layer so users don't have to worry about where my workflow data stored and how it got stored. All you got is you have the data available somehow through some magic glue code that is done by the platform team. Another thing we want to achieve is we want to automate the dependency management. So as workflow developer, you don't have to worry about which library I have to package with my workflow or which dependency I have to bring in. So we make this all automatic. OK, now we'll dive deep into the Lua engine. As I said, we use Lua engine to orchestrate your workflows. The Lua engine decides what should be done, and what conditions. It provides a runtime environment for the workflows so it can run in the Netflix ecosystem. It is a forward training uh, engine. It is data driven. If we zoom in a Lua, uh, Lua engine, you will find out the Lua engine consists of three components. One is a workflow manager which uh, decides the life cycle of a workflow. It controls start of a workflow, stop a workflow, and decides which specific version you should run at this engine. Another component is uh, the workflow uh, engine runtime. So runtime consists of two items. First item is the workflow executors, which essentially is a thread pool that runs all the workflows. The second part is the runtime dependency, where we plug in all the Netflix-related runtime library, like auto-discovery, configurations, so that the server can be running in the Netflix environment. These blue dots, as you can <coughs> see, these are what we call workflows. So as you can see here, there are many, many such kind of workflows here. So it means that engine actually supports multi-tenancy. So you can have many different workflows run in the same environment, and they are all isolated. If we zoom in to the blue dot, you can see that workflow consists of two parts. One is the loops that you describe in Groovy DSL. The second part is the data model that you describe the data structures needed for your workflow. And we put them together as OSGI bundles so they can be running in the environment as Lua engine. So about Lua DSL. So uh, we abstract the workflow execution logic into kind of four parts, like match, action, reaction, and error. So the match block basically tells us <laughs> under what condition should your action run. The action block tells us what kind of execution you will have to execute when there's a match or the condition meets. The reaction part handles 
the responses, right? When your action invokes a remote function or media heavy computation like serverless function, uh, Naveen had discussed. So when the computation is done, reaction will get invoked and will handle the responses as the user describer in the loop. The last part, the error block, it handles something unexpected, right? We write program, we know something, you don't foresee there's a runtime exception or null point. So this is your last rescue. If something unforeseen happened, you got a chance to handle that logic here. So the error block will be your chance to handle unexpected errors. So essentially your rule will look like this. You change the match, action, reaction, error blocks together. So we let our users focus on describing this logic in very high level languages. So I will describe in more detail for each of them. So match logic. So this is a very simple example of match logic. Here we got a video source that contains a bagging pass, has your raw media data. Then we got a recipe or the video encode recipe that describes some <coughs> code information, how does your output should be looks like. Then another part, the last part is output. So in this loop, it basically tells us if there's a source and the recipe, we don't see an output yet from the <coughs> source and recipe, then you do something, right? So behind the scene, this translates a runtime is like this. For all the combinations of the source and the recipe, then let's get output if it doesn't exist yet. So this translates two for loops calls with if condition. Another variation is if you want to focus on certain recipes only, for example, you're interested on, on the only codec type <coughs> from FMPEG Netflix Proteus codec type, you can further narrow down with certain filtering criteria. <laughs> Another interesting uh, logic about the matching is we also support collection support. So in this example, basically essentially is tell the system C from this source and recipe, I want to find out all the chunks that is from this source. Right, this is exact example as I mentioned in the previous slide. We do many chunkings, right? So once all of them are ready, now they fit to the assembly process. So that's how we find out all the related chunks from the source and recipe. So now we come to the action example. So action is relatively simple. In this example, Basically, it tells the system, see, I'm going to create output that will be the placeholder, right, and make the state as running at this moment. Then it start preparing an encode request. The last line, it invokes the remote function, encoder dot encoder. So this is essentially sending a request mm -hmm. to the remote service function does this encode computation remotely. The good side is it can be also a remote service as well, but they all go through the same function annotation. This makes test really simple. You simply test the function interface level so you don't really have to integrate function or remote service to do your unit test or intuition test. So you just test that interface level. As I said, re reaction is for responses, right? Once the remote computation is done or service request returned, then this function, this reaction block will be invoked automatically for you. So in this example, we simply set our output state as ready and we copy the path into our output path from the response. So if something unexpected happens, some exceptions long at your function or remote call returns 500 errors exception, then your error block will be got invoked. In this example, we simply set our output 
state in error, then we copy the error messages to our output. Data models. So for each workflow, user can define their own data model, and they kind of pretty much have the freedom to define any data model as they want, use the protobuf. And the system also behind the scene automatically add some common field to it, so user don't have to repeatedly type the field for each of your data model. Like we add like object ID, creation time, update timestamp for <coughs> each of the data you need. So once you have your data model done and rules defined, right, and done enough testing, you wanna ship it. We also have introduced a tooling that is goes through the Gradle plugin that makes your packaging really easy. So you don't have to learn anything about OSGI or bundle creation. All this is hidden through the plugin. Another great thing is users also don't have to worry about dependencies they brought in. So the plugin automatically figure out what is already provided by the runtime and what is missing actually is used by your workflow component. Then it only brings in those packages that need it, then package it, ship it. So to wrap it up, we introduced a new DSL that abstracts the commonality of workflow logic that greatly reduces the boilerplate code that our new developer has to use to write. And the rich match expression enables us to develop a very complicated workflow logic. The compile time check, uh, type check at the function interface or the data model side, it really helps us to catch errors early at compile time instead of us to debug the things at the runtime. Then automatic dependency management actually boosts the user product a lot. They just write regular libraries. They don't have to worry about anything about OSGI or how do I bring in libraries. The multi-tenancy support at our new engine a reduces a lot of our operational overhead and the management. Uh, that's it. Do we have any time for questions? Two questions. Okay. Any questions? Uh, hi. Uh, so, from the description of the um, first match section uh, of the workflow, it seems like the system allows users um, to make pretty expensive queries, like go through the whole corpus of videos or do multiple nested loops or something like that. So, how do you deal with multiple users writing those very expensive queries, and how do you um, prioritize some use cases over the others? So the question is, looks like the loo is allow the user to do very expensive queries. Uh, so my answer is they are not expensive because all this query is done at local, not go through cloud. So when the workflow runs, we load the project as into local memory so all this operation is done with local in-memory data, so they are really very efficient. Uh, so I guess the question is not about the match itself, it's about what's gonna be running after that. So let's say I write the match like for every video which doesn't have a new encoding, create a new encoding. So that's the second part is gonna be very expensive. Yes, yes, that's true. So the question is, when there's a massive amount of video encoding happens, so they will be very expensive. That is totally true. I think the media, media heavy operation is very expensive, and they are not done at the low engine. 
we actually sending the message to the remote functions that Naveen just talked about that. So we have a huge amount of uh, uh, server pools for that. So they automatically go up, scale up if there's a back pressure on the request. So does that answer your question? We can follow up later. Okay. Any more questions? Frank, well, I, I, I can. Uh, I, I think I know what you're talking about. Frank. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Um, I'm Frank. I work with uh, Naveen and George. Uh, it is possible to, um, by making a, a change <coughs> to the rules to the workflow, a developer might inadvertently um, schedule, you know, 100 million hours of compute time. Um, and I guess the answer is we're really careful about that. Um, and also, it's pretty obvious when something like this, that does happen, um, that it's happening. So uh, there are techniques that we've learned over the years um, when making, because we've been using these, this technique for a while of staging our work. And so there's different kind of throttling and um, uh, control practices that all the developers who work with these workflows are familiar with. I think that concludes our talk section. Um, so I'm Vinod Vishwanathan. We have Hans here, Naveen, George, and we'll be in the happy hour and there is some more food and we can hang out and talk about uh, anything else that uh, that will be interesting to us. Thank you. <laughs>